Okay, well, thank you very much for the introduction, Jen, and thanks everybody for sharing your lunch hours with me. And uh, I hope you enjoy the experience of having a little disembodied head of me up in the corner. Uh, I'm broadcasting to you out here from, uh, from UBC on the traditional uh, territory of the Musqueam people. And hopefully you can see behind me there my, my non-denominational uh, holiday tree. Uh, so it's a pleasure to, to reach out to you in this way, and I, I hope that you're all eating something tasty for your lunch. And uh, uh, thank you very much for sharing your time. Um, so we're going to talk about tendinopathy, um, update on research, particularly um, recent evidence or um, some, and also some older evidence that uh, I like to highlight in these talks, uh, which really supports an exercise-based approach to rehabilitation. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping to hit a variety of types of evidence uh, from basic science all the way to clinical trials and clinical guidelines. Uh, we're mainly going to focus on Achilles and patella tendinopathies. And um, looking at the registration list, I understand that uh, probably 80, 90% of the people listening are physiotherapists, and, and that's also my own background. Um, so I am really talking from that perspective. So uh, welcome, and, and here we go. So we're gonna review some mechanisms of exercise-based rehab for tendinopathy. So how does it actually work? Um, we use exercise all the time, and, and it, it has a variety of different mechanisms. And uh, so I'm gonna talk about some specific ones where the exercise is actually influencing the tendon healing process. Uh, we're gonna talk about different sort of factors that can go into your clinical reasoning uh, when you're prescribing rehab. And um, uh, something I'm quite excited about is, uh, this is my, one of my first opportunities to present the results of a new uh, randomized controlled trial that, uh, that we did here in Vancouver and also tied in some other sites around the world. And uh, this is looking at a pretty controversial treatment uh, PRP or platelet-rich plasma, which uh, a lot of people with tendinopathies are looking into that uh, to try and accelerate their rehab. So uh, UBC uh, and myself, we're very proud to be presenting the results of the first uh, placebo-controlled trial for PRP in patellar tendinopathy. So we'll talk about that uh, towards the end. So this is kind of a, you know, a caricature of what medicine is all about um, when the patient comes in with some sort of a pain. And uh, the, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. We're not uh -oh. sharing your screen or we're not seeing your screen. Oh, you can't see it. Okay. We're not seeing it. No. Okay. I did hit the share button, um, but I'm going to try again. Can you see it now? Nope. I, I am hitting the share button, uh, okay. Jen. I'm going to, um, I'm going to share my script. I'm going to share it. How okay. 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 So, sorry. Oh, no uh, problem. Okay. So you're just getting my disembodied voice right now. Always some technical issues. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I love technology. Okay. So yeah, this, this is really a caricature of, of, uh, of medicine. Um, but I think you could argue, you know, that uh, this is the sort of quick fix that a lot of uh, people are going for. And, and certainly physicians are trained um, that they're looking for a treatment to prescribe to the individual. So I'm going to just say that that's, uh, that problem actually, that, that, that prescription doesn't work so well when, we, when we're thinking about how we prescribe exercise, right? So the, the analog to that would be uh, do 90 heel drops uh, and, and do that uh, twice a day and call me in six weeks, right? Uh, for patellar tendinopathy would be do 90 uh, eccentric squats and call me in, in, uh, in six weeks. And so um, really it doesn't account for actually how exercise works, right? Exercise, as we know, it has to be individualized and, uh, and gradually progressively um, increased in, in load as the tissues adapt. So um, I think the, the current trend is that we're moving away from more of a recipe-based approach to physiotherapy. So I'd just like to, to start uh, with a case, um, which was uh, presented by myself and Tommy Gershman from Fortius Sports Medicine. Uh, this is a, a young woman with patellar tendinopathy, uh, left-sided anterior knee pain, worse with jumping, um, very sore uh, before and after practices and games. Uh, this is a high-level volleyball player, so she, she jumps a lot, and, and it's a big part of the sport. Um, she has multiple practices and weekend tournaments. Um, medical history otherwise was un not unusual, but she, she did have type 1 uh, diabetes mellitus. She has a normal x-ray, so there's no uh, bony changes. 
Uh, she's too old to be considering growth plate type abnormalities. Um, and her ultrasound shows a thickened tendon with some hypoechoic areas, so some black spots on the uh, ultrasound scan. And she has a, a pretty typical exam. Uh, she's got a tender left patellar tendon, especially on the proximal uh, part where it's uh, originating off of the patella. She's got some muscle tightness. Uh, she's got some muscle atrophy. And she doesn't have anything to indicate that this is patellofemoral pain syndrome. Uh, full range of motion, no swelling around the joint or anything like that. So before she uh, presented to Tommy uh, at 40 Sports Medicine, she tried to splint, uh, basically trying to unload the tissue and rest it to see if that would resolve it. And uh, she had a little bit of physiotherapy, but nothing really like a progressive rehabilitation program. And um, so when the season restarted, um, she was doing some eccentric exercises on top of that. But really, um, unfortunately, this is an all too common outcome. She had no resolution of her pain and uh, she ended up having to quit volleyball and is now focusing on like, non-weight bearing type activities. So, you know, that's one specific case presentation, but, um, and I, it's good to keep that in mind. It's very humbling actually. Some tendinopathies really just don't resolve. And um, we could think about that case and, and, and realize that maybe she didn't get the optimal management. Uh, she was given that recipe based approach. So just think, you know, about the variety of patients uh, that we see who have tendinopathy. Um, for the Achilles, we've got, you know, highly conditioned athletes. Um, and then we've also got very sedentary individuals who maybe uh, were playing a little bit of soccer or maybe there's something else about the way they're moving or some lifestyle conditions uh, that are leading into their tendinopathy. Um, same with patellar tendinopathy. It tends not to happen in the sedentary group. It's usually the exercise group, but there can still be a wide variety of, um, of sort of demands that that tendon has to, has to withstand. So this actually is gonna feed right into what's the baseline level of this person's tissue health. And, um, and, and so where are we gonna start with their exercise prescription? Where are we gonna try and get them to? So really tendinopathy is, is not a one size fits all diagnosis. It's just a syndrome. And really it just means that that tendon is painful when there's load going through it. So it tends to be, you know, especially for the lower extremity, a, a very straightforward diagnosis. Uh, it's tender on palpation, and it's sore when you do tests or, or movements that put load through that tendon. And yet, it, it, the presentations are, are very individualized. So if we just think for a moment about somebody with patella tendinopathy, what are all the different multifactorial things that can feed in and, uh, and, and end up with that person having a painful tendon? Well, there's their whole activity profile. So what, what type of loading um, history do they have? Do they have a previous injury? And very importantly is the biomechanics. So I've given you reference there, uh, Becker et al, American Journal of Sports Medicine, they've done a systematic review of biomechanical factors that sort of put you at increased risk of developing a tendinopathy. And really the one thing that they all have in common is they increase the load through the tendon. So in the case of patellar tendon, it's common to see uh, uh, weaknesses uh, or tightnesses around the hip, the quads, the calf, and the hamstring muscles. Um, there's also some evidence around landing techniques. Um, so people who land with more flexibility, who absorb more force through the ankle uh, and through the hip. Um, uh, that, so, so not doing those things is a risk factor for tele, patella tendinopathy. But I just like to say this is really an area where um, the, the, the sort of knowledge amongst the physiotherapy community is, is really ahead of where the research is at. And, and basically what all we were taught to do is, is to do our full biomechanical scan and, and test the movements that the person needs to do during their sport or activity and, and, and that's sort of that kinetic chain approach. So the research is definitely starting to support uh, that approach. Um, in a more standardized way, but just look at that whole person and the whole kinetic chain. Um, there's a little bit of data coming out now on, on sort of the psychosocial attributes and whether or not that is, is a cause or a consequence of the person's pain. So, you know, people, Al, yeah, can you hear me? Sorry to interrupt again. Um, yeah. I'm not sure that I'm keeping up the slides with your talk. What, which slide are you on? Oh gosh, um, I'm still on the, it's a slide with the person's uh, knee. Uh, so I'll just indicate when I'm changing slides, okay? Okay, okay, so we're here or, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, okay. I can't see what you see, but we're just looking at a person's knee. Okay. Different risk factors around it. 
Uh, which which number is it? I don't have uh, numbers on the slides. Um, was, so we were looking at Jill Cook, uh, a picture of Jill Cook. It said, what is tendinopathy? Okay. And then right after that, we're looking yeah, at all the... Okay. So, okay, good. Yeah, so, one. Yeah. Just let me know when you change. Okay, Jen. Thanks, sorry. Yeah, no, my apologies to everybody who's... Uh, we'll, we'll try and get, get it better from here on. Um, so the concept here is that the assessment needs to be multifactorial. Um, looking at the kinetic chain, looking at and assessing that person as an individual, who's experiencing the injury, and also looking into their medical history. Um, and there is uh, evidence now that people with high cholesterol levels um, are at a much higher risk of developing tendinopathies. And um, quite often it's tendon pain, which is the first sort of manifestation of, of very high cholesterol levels. Um, so do, do you suggest that people have that checked if they're presenting to you with tendon pain? Okay, I'm sorry, I don't have time to talk about all these because we've lost a little bit of time now. So I'm gonna advance to the next slide. So we're looking at the failed healing model of tendinopathy. Um, this is, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but um, you know, I've been researching tendon pathophysiology uh, ever since I came here to UBC uh, eight years ago. And really this is my understanding of, of how tendinopathy develops. And it's uh, summarizing animal models and also what I've been able to observe in human tissues. Basically what happens is the tendon is repetitively loaded and normally the cell in the matrix are able to respond to that and they adapt. Um, so the tendon can actually get stronger, it can get thicker, and we get a, an exercise adaptation with that. But if we've got continued loading that's sort of beyond uh, what the body can, can withstand, then we start to get accumulation of injury to the collagen and to the cells inside the tendon. And uh, that injury is often concentrated at biomechanical weak points, like the attachments of the muscle to the tendon or of the tendon to the bone. And we, we do get a low level of activation of inflammatory pathways. We get macrophages in the tissue. And so you get this chronic uh, injury repair response going on that gradually builds up. So this is, this is just a classic overuse injury scenario, which uh, causes that tendon to become thicker. Uh, it's got it, it's accumulation of failed repair tissue. And then in association with that pain, uh, we start to develop weakness and altered uh, movement patterns. So I actually haven't seen any evidence about uh, tendinopathy that is not consistent with that failed healing model of tendinopathy. So it's gonna go forward to the next slide now. Um, so there's a lot of talk about pain science, so it's worth just thinking, can we learn anything from contemporary pain science about uh, patellar and Achilles tendinopathies. Um, there's quite a good systematic review here in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. And uh, so people have assessed that. They've, they've looked for evidence of nervous system sensitization, of central sensitization. And basically the conclusion is um, the pain is essentially a peripheral uh, state. It, it doesn't involve a lot of central sensitization. You've got an accumulation of injured tissue and it's getting irritated, and so you're getting nociception from the injured tissue, which leads into the person having a pain experience. So it's just worth keeping in mind um, that that's that the tendinopathy is very much a load-related uh, nociception type scenario. So what can we do to try and help that tissue recover? Um, I just briefly want to, I, you can't give a tendon talk without mentioning Jill Cook's continuum model, which is shown on the left. Um, because it is so, so very popular. Um, and so the continuum model basically says that normal tendon uh, under conditions of excessive load uh, can become reactive. And they don't actually define what that reactivity is. Um, and then if that goes on, then you can end up in a situation of disrepair. So, so really that's a more complicated and kind of more abstract way of thinking about how tendon gets injured. I do prefer the failed repair model because it's based on actual observations. And so here's just some sample data from people uh, from actual tendon biopsies, like comparing people with early tendinopathy versus intermediate to a more advanced tendinopathy. And those little dots represent individual patients and those are the number of macrophages in their tissue. So you can see you go through an early inflammatory phase and then it uh, sort of partially resolves, but you've still got more um, inflammation in the tissue. So I realize that that is kind of a paradigm shift for a lot of people, but that is uh, 
That's the current understanding of tendon pain. Um, just very quickly, this is my, my PhD work. I spent a lot of time looking at the histopathology of patellar tendon pain. And um, you, you see the, these sort of different zones in the tendon. Um, the first zone, what I'm calling zone one, uh, right close to where the patella is, is you get a, a big area of uh, fibrocartilage that forms. And that, that's actually uh, an adaptive change, right? It doesn't have signs of injury. What it shows is that the, um, the tendon is adapting to the very high loads that are being placed through it with all that jumping activity. And it's, it's making its fiber cartilage bigger there. Um, I think it's the body's way of minimizing that abrupt uh, stress concentration between the soft tendon and the harder patella. So um, that that's, could be considered an adaptive response. Just distal to that zone two, that's where the actual injury is occurring, where you see all that filled tissue and that healing response going on. That's where you see more blood vessels growing in. And then uh, distal to that, you have another zone of adaptation where you've just got more cells proliferating and more uh, matrix being produced. So that's, that's um, basically what tendinopathy looks like. And that zone two, that failed repair tissue, that looks the same um, at all the different tendinopathies uh, around the body. So the consequences of having this sort of, oh shoot, Jen, um, we're, on, we're on a slide now. I hope you're keeping up. Uh, we're on a slide of a graph now. It says are the mechanic. I'm keeping up. Okay. I think I'm keeping up, yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So basically as physios, right? Um, so what, what are the mechanical consequences of having an injured tissue? Well, it's, it's not a stiff. If you put the same amount of load or stress through it, it stretches more. And this is partly why you get stuck in this cycle of chronic injury, um, because the tissue, as you can see, the control uh, is, is, is more stiffer. It's got better ability to withstand loads. And in people with tendinopathy, we've lost that. And that's been observed um, in a number of studies. And there's, there's a systematic review there which demonstrates it. Um, we've done a little bit of that work out here at UBC. So if, um, we, we have a new way of measuring tendon stiffness that I've been testing out in the lab here. And I'm kind of excited about it. I hope that it starts to catch on. We use that, that little blue device, it's called the myoton. And you can get an actual measure of Achilles tendon stiffness um, just by holding that probe against the tendon and it, it taps the tissue and it's able to measure how stiff it is. And you can see um, in a group of people with ten Achilles tendinopathy, uh, there's that loss of tendon stiffness. Um, there's a lot of overlap you can see between the controls and the tendinopathies. So it's not really a diagnostic tool, um, but what we're looking into now is whether we can take that stiffness deficit and see it improving over time during rehabilitation. I'm gonna to go to the next slide here. We've got three little sort of scatter plots. Can you see that with dots? And it, um, so this is just some more data from our lab showing that the, the stiffness level of the tissue actually correlates with people's symptoms, which I think is fascinating. So the top left there, we're looking at the Visa A score. This is a score uh, which sort of ranks how healthy your Achilles tendons are functioning. So perfectly healthy tendon gets 100. And then down to the, to the left, um, you're getting lower and lower Visa A values. And there's a correlation between the stiffness and the Visa A. So the more stiffness you've lost, the worse your symptoms are. And same thing is happening with thickness. So the more thickened your tendon is, the more of that gunky repair tissue it's got in there. Um, the less stiff uh, the tendon is. Um, there's also, you can see bottom left there, there's a normal kind of age-related uh, loss of tendon stiffness as we get older. And that's why uh, tendon tendinopathies are so much more common as we get older. So I'm gonna go to the next slide now. This is just a, a reminder of what tendon anatomy looks like. Um, so tendons are, are, are really highly cellular. Like they're not just this dense, uh, white gristle, um, they're full of cells. And so on the right-hand side there, I hope you can see just how cellular the tendon tissue is. Um, at, at the top, uh, all those little black dots are representing the cells. In the middle, uh, the red are the cell nuclei of the, of the tendon fibroblasts, and the green is actual, actually cellular contents. Uh, so there's pretty much just as much cellular content as there is uh, collagen. The bottom uh, image in yellow is really interesting. So that the tendon cells, tenocytes, are marked out with little C's. And so all of that yellow material, those are uh, cells. And you, I hope you can see, they look like little spiders and they're kind of reaching out 
and making uh, junctions with each other. And they actually have functional little junctions with one another they, they communicate uh, with. So we've got a cell signaling network embedded right in our tendons. I'm advancing to the next slide now where we're looking at some tendon anatomy and uh, we've got a bunch of green cells. And so what we're illustrating here is that uh, those junctions between the cells are uh, very important in sensing and responding to mechanical loading. Um, so as we stretch that tendon, um, you can see in, in the top right location one, that cell up in the top right corner has uh, sensed some mechanical load, like a stretch going through the tendon. And it uh, communicates with cell signaling messengers, in this case, IP3, a, a wave of cell signaling all through the tendon cells in the tissue. And this is actually the, the mechanism by which tendon responds and adapts to mechanical loading. So the bottom right is some data from our lab where we actually grow human tendon cells in the lab and we can stretch them and exercise them right in the cell culture dish, which is, which is really cool. And you can see um, the more uh, cycles, the more stretches you give them, um, and especially if you give them a nice rest in between each stretch, we get more and more uh, collagen synthesis as a result. So this is how tendon adapts. So we can see that in cell culture. I've, uh, Jen, I've skipped ahead now to a big slide that's titled determinants of tendon adaptation are being revealed. And something really exciting that's happened in the last uh, 10 years is that now we can look at tendon adaptation in human beings, right? Not just in the cell culture dish or in the animals, but we can do this in people now. Um, and the way we do it is, is a little bit um, uh, complicated to describe, but we get a stiffness measure. So you can uh, calculate the, the load versus the um, stretch through the tendon and we get the stiffness. And so on the right-hand side, I'm showing you um, the results of a meta-analysis from 2015, um, which looked at all the different studies that have given an exercise program. This is all done in healthy individuals and then measured the change in tendon stiffness over time. And they divided the studies into those which used high intensity exercise. So at least 70% or higher of maximum voluntary contraction and versus the low intensity at the bottom of the graph. And you can see that the high intensity exercise group um, generally results in an adaptive response in the tissue. It doesn't matter if it's eccentric loading, it doesn't matter if it's concentric or isometric, uh, just as long as it's high intensity. And longer duration stretches, so it's like seven second long stretches, uh, induce more tendon adaptation than quick, short uh, duration, like jumping type activities. And that, that's also true in the lab as well. That's the long stretches are the best way to stimulate collagen synthesis in tendons. So I've gone on to the next slide now, this is exercise versus weight and C for Achilles tendinopathy. Um, this is a, a classic paper, it's about 12 years old now, but it's the only paper that we have which actually demonstrated that exercise, in this case it was eccentric loading, compared to not doing anything, that it increases uh, people's function. So I've put a little blue box there around the visa A score, comparing the exercise group to the group which didn't get any treatment. So clearly people, you know, this is a condition which needs to be treated and it does respond to exercise. Going on to the next slide now, um, this is a 2015 paper from the American Journal of Sports Medicine. And um, this is uh, getting us to think outside the box a little bit, that it doesn't just have to be eccentric training. Um, and what they did in this study is they compared heavy, slow resistance training using a gym-based program uh, to eccentric training. It was a proper randomized control trial, and the Visa A score improved in both groups. But the satisfaction uh, and the exercise compliance was a lot better in the group which got the gym-based program. And if you're curious about that gym-based program, it's very much based on this concept of heavy, slow, like seven to 10 second long uh, repetitions. And um, you can take people right into their painful range here, like five or six out of pain, out, out, of, out of 10 uh, pain during the exercise. And any pain during the exercise is fine as long as they don't have worse pain or uh, worse symptoms, uh, stiffness, et cetera, the next day. Um, so you, and there's, in all the studies that have looked at exercise for Achilles and tendinopathy, there's never been 
a patellar tendon or an Achilles tendon rupture. So it's a, it's a very safe exercise protocol. And uh, generally, you know, satisfaction ratings with this type of gym-based program are very high, 70, 80, 90%. Um, so as a result, I've, I've gone on to the next slide now. This is JOSPT Perspectives for Practice. Um, this is a clinical guideline, um, which I gave you in your handouts. And it's got lots of guidelines, you know, on how to diagnose. We said that was, that was fairly straightforward, how to, what assessment procedures to use. Uh, and I'm just highlighting the intervention strategies here for you. Um, so if we look at people who've got a more acute presentation, um, they're recommending, you know, some sort of modalities to try and settle down the inflammation, uh, stretching, you know, some, some anti-inflammatory strategies, um, taping if the person has uh, you know, something about the, their, their, uh, the way they're moving that you can identify that could be corrected with taping, like too much pronation. But for the chronic or non-acutes, um, the clinical practice guideline now is, is recommending mechanical loading exercises. Um, and you can choose whether that's going to be eccentric, concentric eccentric, or heavy load and slow speed. So it's, it, both are currently recommended now in the clinical practice guideline. Um, so, you know, we talked, we go, just looping back to the beginning, I'm on the slide now, which is uh, entitled How to Optimize Biomechanics and that kinetic chain approach. Um, we don't have uh, randomized control trial level evidence for this yet. We've got some really good case series out there. It, these kind of things are hard to do in randomized trials because it's sort of individualized patient interventions, right? Um, so this is a really nice uh, case study here that I'm showing you on the right. Um, where they actually had a runner who was having pain onset with running. And they actually asked them to log uh, the distance that they were able to run on any given day before the onset of pain. And they tracked that, you can see in that graph on the top right, over the first uh, 15 days. And, and then they, uh, they gave a really simple intervention, which is anti-pronation taping, because the person was having this dynamic collapse of their arch with running. And right away, you can see that they're able to run uh, much, much longer before the onset of their pain. You can see that during the B phase when the taping was applied. And then just to confirm, you know, that the improvement that this patient experienced was due to the taping, we take the tape away again, then they, they sort of go back to where they were beforehand. So apply a corrective intervention. If you can find something that changes somebody's symptoms uh, by changing the way they move, definitely do it. Um, there's another systematic review mentioned there for you, which uh, sort of gives you some ideas about the types of things to look for, but it's really just a kinetic chain uh, assessment. So the next slide I've gone on to, Jen, is called Extra Exercise Allowed During Rehabilitation. And um, so this, is, uh, this was a trial by Silvernagel et al. Uh, from 2013, and she was trying to answer the question, so if you put uh, somebody in a rehab program, um, can they keep exercising um, while they're doing rehab? And the answer is yes. So they randomized them into two different groups. Uh, one group where they were told you can only do your rehab. Uh, and the other group said you can uh, keep doing your exercise, whether that's running or tennis or whatever. Uh, but just make sure your symptoms don't go, uh, like your pain levels don't go more than a five or six out of ten. And you can see people continue to recover. Uh, as long as they're doing the rehab and as long as they keep their um, loading within what they consider a safe level. So this is really nice data for your patients to say they don't have to stop doing what they're doing. If they do the rehab, then they can keep, um, keep competing. Um, next slide is called imaging as outcome measure. And um, remember we said tendinopathy is this kind of thickened uh, situation with more repair tissue that's accumulated in there. And we know that gradually what happens over time is as people recover, uh, the tendon gets less thick. And some of those dark, like hypoechoic areas start to disappear. Um, and what I'm showing you here on the right is an example from one of our clinical trials. And um, in figure C, I'm pointing to a, a hypoechoic area right on the kind of dorsal surface of the person's Achilles tendon. And after 12 weeks, that hypoechoic area was totally gone. And, and that was confirmed at the bottom there. We did some, some color mapping. Um, but with that said, that was kind of uh, a really nice example to show. 
a lot of people get better and those hypocoic areas haven't gone away and the tendon is not uh, substantially uh, thinning, thinning down again and remodeling. So for that reason, um, ultrasound is not recommended as an assessment measure uh, for people with Achilles tendinopathy. Uh, it's not good for follow-ups because it, it sort of focuses people on the status of their tendon tissue. And um, I like to think this is like any other soft tissue. Um, it heals, uh, but it doesn't necessarily look normal anymore. And so I think the imaging can be a little bit misleading. As long as it's healed and as long as it's functional and as long as the symptoms are getting better, then um, it doesn't really matter what it looks like, right? Um, okay, so the, the next slide is called Study Design Comparison of Eccentric Exercise with Heavy Slow Resistance Training. So this is the same treatment approach that we showed you, but applied to the patellar tendon. And I, I love this study. It's a few years old now, but it's just a classic. Um, they randomized a group of people with patellar tendinopathy into three different groups. Um, they either got a corticosteroid injection, um, they did eccentric training, so with a decline uh, board there, or they did the heavy slow resistance training. And I really recommend you to go and, and, and have a look at that paper um, if you're treating people with patellar tendinopathy. And uh, the key difference here is just how satisfied people were with the heavy slow resistance, uh, resistance training program compared to the other methods of treatment. And Jim, I'm skipping on now to a graph that's titled Function, Visa P. So these are the, the, th the outcomes in those three different groups. And as you can see, the best outcomes are in that uh, dotted line uh, HSR, heavy slow resistance training. So their Visa score continued to improve um, throughout the course of the study. The corticosteroid group, they did seemed to do better initially, but then they, they, they uh, kind of recurred in the long run. And so corticosteroids for that reason, they're not a recommended treatment for Achilles or, or patella tendinopathy. Um, and I think the heavy slow resistance training group did a little bit better than the eccentric training group. Uh, I've skipped on to the next slide, tendon thickness. Um, this is just showing that that uh, tendon did, you know, on, on average gradually get a little bit thinner over time, so there's some, some remodeling in the tendon going on in the patellar tendon. Um, but the picture on the right-hand side is, is really key. Um, they, they were able to get biopsies from the people who did the heavy slow resistance training. And what they did is they, they actually counted up and measured the size of the number of collagen fibrils in the tissue before, uh, before and after exercise. And so the, I, I hope you can see the difference of this a lot more small collagen fibrils that have been produced with the training program. And I'm just gonna go to the next slide, which is a bigger view of that because it's such a key result. Like this is actually the only biopsy study that we have for patellar tendinopathy uh, in response to exercise. And so on the left is before exercise, on the right is after exercise. And look at all that new collagen in the tendon. Like that's just fantastic. So that's. The, the cells they sensed, they responded to the exercise and they were able to uh, produce more collagen as a result. So like the final piece of this puzzle is going to be to use um, the, like that little gizmo I showed you, the myoton, and see if we can actually track the tendon getting stronger over time with rehab. I think that'll be the next study that needs to happen here. So the next slide is called Recommended Physiotherapy Treatment Paradigm for Tendinopathy. Um, so this is just the idea that although the rehab is having great impact on the tendon itself, um, that you know we're still we're still physios. We still like to treat the entire person, and we like you know you're going to get better buy-in with the rehab program if you treat the whole person um, and find out what their goals are, and and sort of uh, make sure that the education about the treatment is is individualized to them. You know, include that biomechanical assessment. Um, do something for analgesia if you can. Um, so like in the, in the clinical guideline, they were recommending some kind of uh, topical anti-inflammatory uh, for a short period, if that might be helpful to bring pain levels down, or if you have other things at your disposal that you can use that can bring pain levels down a little bit, that can be very helpful. Uh, but really the core is this rehab program. Um, so we're loading the tendon, but we're also addressing all the motor impairments that we can see there. So the next slide here is called adjunct medical treatments. 
So as we saw for the patellar corticosteroid injections, they can give some short-term pain relief, but they tend to give poor long-term results. Um, in the shoulder is the one tendinopathy where they actually, for some reason, they don't seem to have that risk of longer-term recurrence. So uh, doctors will still tend to use corticosteroid injections for the shoulder. Um, but the actual effect size of pain relief is not uh, that much bigger than you would just get with oral uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So corticosteroids are, are you know, a little bit overrated, but I'm not a doctor, I'm a physiotherapist, and I'm just speaking to the evidence that's there. Um, there is some evidence that topical analgesics can be, can be helpful, and I'll show you a study from our lab in a second on that. Um, so there's other injection type therapies, uh, sclerotherapy or prolotherapy, where they're injecting um, sclerosing substances or, or sugar to try and stimulate a repair response. Um, these are, are uh, very low quality evidence studies and they're not supported by uh, like Cochrane level systematic reviews. Um, the PRP, I promise we're gonna show you our results, but the bottom line is that that has been shown actually to be ineffective. Um, so we don't have great injection strategies that we can recommend alongside uh, exercise. Um, there's this other kind of kooky therapy out there. It's called nitric oxide. It's uh, sort of been picked up in Australia because that's where some of the original studies were done. And so this actually involves taking a little angina patch and cutting it into four and uh, placing that angina patch right over the sore tendon. And the idea is that it's going to stimulate some blood flow and stimulate some collagen synthesis in the tendon. Um, there is a recent systematic review on it, but uh, again, the evidence is, is not there. Uh, it seems particularly to do absolutely nothing for patellar tendinopathy. Um, there was one positive and one negative study for Achilles tendinopathy. So uh, not super helpful. Um, the next slide is called common treatment, uh, common treatment pitfalls, but I'm just going to skip over that in the interest of time. Um, so the, the next slide is called local results with this approach. And what I mean with this approach, I'm talking about that integrated physio management with the heavy slow resistance training. Um, so I was really lucky to have uh, a student here coming through the MRSC program, Trevor Vanderdeel, and, and we just wanted to see if we could duplicate those results with the heavy slow resistance training, because um, that was just a single study from Copenhagen. So the good news is we can, we can do that. We can get the same results here in, uh, in Vancouver. Um, this was just a chart review, but it shows really the same type of findings. Um, we're looking on the right hand side, I'm just highlighting that numeric pain rating scale because um, I find this really helpful as um, uh, a way of checking in with people's pain levels. And the way we did it is uh, we got them to do a, a single decline squat on, on that uh, decline board that I showed you. And you asked them to rate their pain out of 10 uh, with a squatting movement. And that sort of tracks, uh, it's a good way of tracking their recovery over time. And as you can see, this person had a really good result. They got completely resolved. Um, these were all uh, basketball players with patellotendinopathy. I'm just gonna go to the next slide now. Um, so this is change in clinical status. And this is using the Visa P score in response to that heavy slow resistance training program. And we got basically identical results. Our Visa, starting Visa P score was in the 50s. And then in the end, the average was about 80, which is exactly what, um, what the original study showed. Um, so this is good news because everybody responded. You know, it's also bad news because nobody was completely recovered. And, you know, that's kind of in keeping with our, with our case um, that we presented at the beginning. It's a really difficult um, condition. Um, so a realistic expectation is we can get people's pain and function to improve, um, but you can't uh, necessarily cure everybody with it. Uh, so the next slide is called PRP for patellotendinopathy trial. Um, very proud of this. So for, if anyone hasn't encountered PRP, um, a lot of naturopaths in the area are doing it, and they also do a lot of these injections in Calgary. And um, I do get phone calls and emails from people um, who have, you know, had this treatment and it, you know, it hasn't been successful, and they're wondering if they should keep going with the injections and and. Um, you know, I never give out medical advice, but what I, my contribution that I can make is we did this proper randomized control trial study. And so the, uh, the, the reason I got involved in this one uh, just very quickly is I was at an, a meeting of the American Orthopedic Sports Medicine Society in uh, Denver. 
And they, that group of surgeons, you know, they're really keen to have something they can inject, something they can do for patients. And, um, and a lot of them were doing PRP. They really wanted to, to have a good clinical trial for PRP, uh, for patella tendinopathy. So I s stupidly stuck up my hand and I said, look, if you're going to do this injection treatment, at least make sure that everybody gets rehab, right? Because we know that um, if you don't do anything, if you don't do rehab, your condition doesn't improve. Um, but rehab is obviously um, a lot better treatment than just giving somebody an, a one-off injection um, because it does so many other things for them as well. So in the end, they said, okay, then, but uh, you're going to do the trial. So all the patients in the trial had to have heavy slow resistance training rehab plus uh, one of two different types of PRP. Um, LR is leukocyte rich. So basically, they, they withdraw some blood from the patient and spin it down and then inject the platelet-rich plasma back into the tendon to try and stimulate the healing response. And they can, depending on the way they spin it, they can either have uh, white blood cells like macrophages in there, because some people think that those are good for healing, or they can do LP PRP, that's leukocyte poor, where they can get rid of the macrophages um, to try and have less of an inflammatory response. And then we also had a saline group as well. So the next slide, these are our results for the trial. Um, we're running a little short on time, so I'm going to skip ahead to the next slide, which is uh, three graphs. This is the same results, but just shown in graphical form. And so let's start on the left-hand side, looking at the visa P, the saline group there uh, that has the dotted line. Uh, you know, would you look at that? It's exactly the same results that we saw uh, with the Copenhagen group. The visa P average started off at around 50 and it cli the average climbed to around 80. So our saline control um, basically had exactly the same results as just uh, heavy slow resistance training by itself. So not much of a placebo effect. Um, the leukocyte poor PRP was not significantly different. The leukocyte rich PRP group, however, though, did significantly worse. Um, and you can see that reflected in the visa P score. There were fewer people who had a significant improvement. Um, pain levels in, this, in the middle there this, with the saline group continued to go down, whereas with the leukocyte rich PRP group, the pain levels were climbing again towards the end. And the patient's overall rating of how improved their condition was, you can see um, with saline or leukocyte poor PRP uh, continued to climb over the course of the study, but with the PRP, it got worse, the leukocyte rich PRP. So I'm skipping to the next slide now. It's change in visa P from zero to 12 weeks. And so I like these kind of graphs where you can see the end of each uh, line represents the improvement of an individual patient from the start of the study to 12 weeks, which was our primary endpoint. And you, the reason I'm showing this is you can see all the different uh, sites had similar trends because um, we had three different sites in the study to recruit enough patients. Um, and the same trend that you can see there is that the saline group is doing better um, and the leukocyte rich PRP, many of them uh, are not doing well or are getting worse. So uh, one of our, my final slides here is we're almost about to run out of time. Um, this is titled Randomized Control Trial Evaluating the Short-Term Analgesic uh, Effect of Topical Diclofenac. This is another randomized trial that came out of my group here at UBC. Um, and it was based on a conversation with uh, Whitecaps, Dr. Jim Bovard. Um, so we want to have something, right, to supplement the rehab program. And they had found that just giving some topical non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can be quite helpful just in terms of bringing the pain levels down a little bit, especially for people who are still want to participate in their sport or activity um, or, and that are having a lot of pain. And so we did a randomized crossover trial. And this is just showing the main outcome, which is uh, pain during uh, hopping activity. And you can see with the clofenac, again, you're able to bring the pain levels down you can't get them to go away completely, but it is a significant uh, reduction in pain, uh, uh, which we didn't see with the placebo response. So, you know, this study has been out there for a couple, uh, well, about a year now, and I know that people are using this. Like, I got some um, emails from the Canadian women's soccer team uh, physio who said that uh, some of their players who have Achilles tendinopathy um, are using Diclofenac uh, to help them get through periods of more intensive loading, and they're finding that helpful. So the next slide is called pros and cons of NSAIDs. 
So, you know, just to keep in mind that there are downsides of using anti-inflammatories, especially long term. Um, rather than talk through that whole slide, I'll just let you know that we are doing a longer term trial right now to try and look at um, uh, whether there's any long term negative effects of people using uh, topical diclofenac. And uh, so hopefully we'll be able to report that in the next year or two. And okay, the very final slide. Does exercise help for other tendon conditions? So um, what do you think? I guess I kind of asked that question with a very positive tone in my voice. So I think you know that the answer is yes. Uh, exercise is very helpful. Um, the story that I've told you for the Achilles and the patellar is the same story for the elbow and the shoulder. So I'm gonna to skip to the next one. I've got two more studies to share with you. This one is my favorite uh, study for uh, rotator cuff tendinopathy. It's from the British Medical Journal. And you can see a very dramatic difference uh, between people who got a specific exercise program for their rotator cuff pain compared to those who didn't. In fact, um, fewer patients in the exercise group ended up going for surgery um, compared to those who didn't get, who just got the sort of sham exercise program. The next slide there is just um, some pictures uh, encouraging you to go and, and have a look at that trial um, because the intervention is given in a lot of detail and so you can easily use that with your patients. And it's, it's probably pretty similar to what a lot of you would be using anyway with your rotator cuff pain patients, uh, just progressive concentric, eccentric, isometric loading and some, a bit of stretching. The next slide there uh, is titled Mobilization with Movement and Exercise. And this is uh, the best study that I know of looking at physiotherapy treatment for a tennis elbow. And um, it's the same story where the corticosteroids were sort of helpful initially, um, but then in the longer term, um, they did worse. Um, physiotherapy compared to just leaving people alone. In this case, um, physiotherapy gets people significantly less pain, more successful treatment, uh, especially at six and 12 weeks on the, the bottom graph. Um, in the end, the people who just did, did nothing on average, uh, they sort of caught up with the physiotherapy group, so their treatment, uh, their, their condition was able to resolve uh, spontaneously, which is, which is not something you always see with Achilles or patellotendinopathies. But the, the key here is that the physiotherapy group uh, did better more quickly. So uh, the next slide here, uh, these are just pictures uh, showing, demonstrating the interventions from the lateral elbow trial. Um, they're all described really nicely in that paper um, to the point where you could actually uh, go ahead and use these with your patients. And the final slide there is just, again, some pictures of the exercises that they used. Um, but we're out of time now, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I apologize for the technical problems that we had at the start. And I'd like to acknowledge Tommy uh, for sharing the case with us, uh, Trevor for sharing his data, um, Jen, very much thank you for the uh, invitation to talk and for all the work you do with Pain DC. And I'd like to thank the people who funded this study as well. And we have some time for questions now, so I'll, I'll hand it back to Jen to help, uh, help coordinate that part of it. Brilliant. Thanks, Alex. That was so interesting. Um, we do have some questions. Okay. I will read them out to you. Okay. Uh, the first um, says that uh, someone is interested in your thoughts on how all this Achilles and patella research applies to other tendinopathies. Also, any particular experience with biceps tendinopathy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really great question because um, a ton of the research is focused on the Achilles. Um, like as a researcher, I love it because it's so easy to measure it. You can see what's happening and changing in the tissue. And we don't always have that same uh, ability to look at that for other tendons. Um, and I think, you know, generally uh, a tendon is a tendon is a tendon. Like they all, uh, and, and I think you can see some common patterns there in that exercise-based rehab uh, is effective for all the tendinopathies that we know about. But there are some really significant challenges um, with some of the tendinopathies that, that I think we don't have a great handle on yet. Um, so for the shoulder, for example, uh, just the, the diagnosis is a real challenge. And as you know, it's not really recommended to try and diagnose uh, a rotator cuff tendinopathy, for example, compared to a bursitis, because um, those two things would go hand in hand. And um, 
And, and so that's sort of a complication around the shoulders that the diagnosis is, is really challenging. Um, and it's also um, hard with like biceps tendinopathy is a great example of posterior uh, uh, tibial tendinopathy is another great example where you've got a, wrap, a long wraparound tendon, uh, which is being compressed and irritated against the bone. And, and that's something that's really, really hard to, uh, to, to deal with, um, with sort of traditional exercise based approach, because, um, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to sort of strengthen that tendon and promote it to repair, just given the anatomic location and function, the way it's sort of impinging and being compressed against the bony, uh, bony prominences. Um, so yeah, I, I totally agree with the question that uh, some of these tendinopathies are, are probably going to be different and we don't have a great evidence base on them yet. Yeah. But I, but I, I would definitely say that the first line of approach has to be, you know, the exercise based rehab and along with, uh, load management. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. You're welcome. Okay. I'm going to read a question and, um, uh, someone is asking for you to comment on, um, oh, hang on, the questions disappeared. Okay, uh, they want you to comment on ESWT versus RSWT efficacy. Oh, right. So extracorporeal shockwave therapy versus radial shockwave therapy. Um, I, I don't uh, feel that we have really good enough quality evidence to be able to conclude A, that they work, or B, that one is better than another. Fortunately, I know that's a cop-out answer, um, but, uh, you know, I, uh, actually, I was really curious about that when I first came to UBC as a faculty member, I thought, let's do some more research on shockwave. Um, I was going to start with the Achilles, um, and I started shopping that around to my collaborators. And one of the, one of the best studies that we found was by DaCosta et al. And, uh, for extracorporeal shockwave therapy, and it found, uh, no difference between those who got the real versus the sham shockwave. Whereas there's other other papers out there um, which 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 do find a difference, and it's really difficult at this point to know if it was something to do with study design or if it was a problem with the way the study was done, like they didn't blind it properly, or there was some other kind of bias creeping into the study. Um, so yeah, uh, that's 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 currently uh, where it's at, and I think that's why you'll see in the, in the clinical practice guidelines, shockwave um, isn't really listed as a treatment yet, because um, I don't think. Um, some of the bigger organizations have, have gotten gotten behind it yet. Uh, with that said, like I can see some really good rationales for why it, why it might be working, and it's it's really good to keep an open mind on those things. Um, so it could be definitely having some effects on the pain system, um, and it could also be stimulating some some tissue repair and healing. Um, but yes, yeah, or I just don't have good enough evidence to be able to take a firm stance on that. Thanks, Alex. Um, okay, next question, and uh, I hope I say this word right. There's all kinds of words in here that okay, <laughs> yeah, probably yeah. I don't have to say. So yeah, no um, apologies. <laughs> um, okay, is there good evidence to support uh, phonophoresis, and if so, what mm -hmm. dose and what medicine? Right. Uh, no, unfortunately, there's not uh, there's not good evidence to support that that I'm that I'm aware of. Um, I guess, I guess good at, you know, it depends on the grading scheme that you use, but um, good evidence would be, uh, you know, a, a sort of substantial body of evidence that, that where, where the effect size is pretty well established by, by more than one study and, and that all the main questions have been answered. And um, yeah, I, I, think, I think it would be some older, older papers that, uh, that, that have looked at that um, that aren't sort of um, part of the current clinical practice guidelines anymore. So it's another one of those things where it makes sense mechanistically, but I don't know if the evidence is there yet, but hey, like a lot of the time the evidence is playing catch up with what physios are doing. Um, and so I think if it's in your scope and if, if it has a good physiological rationale and if the patient responds to it, you know, go for it. Um, but uh, no, as far as I know, um, uh, we don't have great uh, evidence on that one yet. Thanks. Okay, someone would like you to define concentric and eccentric. Oh, right. I'm sorry. You, know, you talk to the physios uh, and, and uh, we're trying to cover a lot of ground, so I apologize. Um, concentric exercise is where the, the muscle is, is shortening. Um, so, you know, if you think about a biceps curl as, you, as, you, as your elbow bends upwards, that would be 
concentric uh, activity of the biceps. And then eccentric is where uh, there's, there's tension, the muscle is active, but it's actually getting longer lengthening. Um, so an example would be uh, a heel drop. So lowering yourself over the edge of a step, um, your calf muscle is under a lot of tension, but it's getting longer. And um, the reason that, that you know, those two distinctions are really important is that um, eccentric exercise, we know is, is a really good stimulus for making muscles longer like it actually adds more sarcomeres into the muscle. So you can literally make your muscle longer. So uh, way better than just uh, passive stretching. If you find somebody who's got tight calf muscles with an Achilles tendinopathy, you know, the heel drops are really important. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, as with any other area of muscle tightness that you identify, you really need to eccentrically load it in order to get some more length in the muscle. So, so apologies, I didn't clarify that earlier in the talk. No problem, Alex. Um, okay, we've got uh, still lots of questions. People are really interested in this. <laughs> well, you know what, in, in case we do run out of time, like I'm happy to take email questions as well. Um, yeah, it's a bit okay. of a embodied experience giving, uh, giving a lecture like this and not being able to see uh, the, the faces in the audience, but uh, I'd, I'd welcome some, some email contact as well. Brilliant, thank you. And um, your email is in the presentation that we shared in the handout. Yeah. In, which is in the chat. The link to that is in the chat. Okay. Okay. Well, um, and, uh, you know, if people want to stay on the call, we can run through these questions as well, if you don't mind, Alex. Sure. Yeah. No, no problem. It's another five minutes. Okay. So um, uh, someone is asking, that they just want to be sure, um, is there any evidence on stretching as an intervention? Uh, yes. Yeah, there is, there is evidence for stretching. Um, I think um, I, would, I would have to dig back. I, I definitely have read some papers uh, for lateral elbow tendinopathy, looking at stretching. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be included in, in the, um, all, all of the studies that I showed to you. There's a strength component, but they always include a stretching component to that. And it, it kind of gets at the issue of we've got these, like a multimodal physiotherapy package that, that we've developed. Uh, through clinical experience and then it's individualized uh, but we've got a protocol and then we test people in an RCT and everybody gets you know all the different components of the treatment depending on on how they present um, so you, you know and, and that's just common sense right so somebody with a tennis elbow um, who doesn't have any muscle tightness that you can find um, then you know stretching is probably not going to be helpful but if they haven't identified uh, restriction and uh, then then that would could be helpful for them. So yeah, it's a combination of um, individualized interventions, which you know, and, and stretching is definitely part of the package. Great. Okay. Next question: uh, What are some key medications we should be concerned about playing a role in tendon pain slash injury? Right. Yeah, that was towards the beginning of the slide when we were having some technical glitches that show that slide of multifactorial things to consider. Um, one, one of the main ones to consider is, um, is antibiotics, so fluoroquinolones. Uh, it's a class of medications that are used to treat, um, treat uh, infections and um, like ciprofloxacin, for example. And what, what you see um, on imaging with those people with MRI is that class of antibiotics just uh, knocks out all the glycosaminoglycan production in the tendon cells. It's really dramatic. Like it just completely knocks the gag production out of the tendon cells, and it it uh, takes months to come back actually. So if people are having that kind of antibiotic treatment, um, you know it it would be worth keeping in mind and being very aware that that's that, that they're in a risky time period for developing a tendinopathy and to back off if they can. Um, and also to always ask about that one during the uh, medical history. For a while, statins were kind of getting a bad rep. Um, there was, there was a, a case series that was published from France that showed um, a lot of people developing tendon problems right after they'd started a statin. Um, but actually, you know, thank goodness for, for the Brits, they actually did a really huge, uh, really well-controlled epidemiological study and they found out that there was actually no risk with statins if, as long as it was properly 
controlled for. So what, what tends to happen is uh, people get into their middle ages, they're getting some high cholesterol levels, they start a statin, and then they develop a tendinopathy. So it was just more of a spurious association rather than a causal one. So um, yeah, we've, we've, we've had to backtrack on that one and, and, and not, uh, and so statins are not really considered a, a risk factor for tendinopathies anymore. The opposite is definitely true. High cholesterol levels um, are, are a substantial risk factor for tendinopathies. And um, there's a form of high cholesterol called familial hypercholesterolemia um, where people have an inherited uh, form where they can't metabolize the cholesterol. And they, these people can end up with heart attacks when they're in their 40s uh, and 50s. And it's often, uh, they have their first heart attack before they've even had their first cholesterol test. Um, but, you know, many, many, many of these people had a long history of tendon problems uh, beforehand, which didn't trigger the, the medical referrals. So please do keep that in mind. Um, get everybody to have their cholesterol checked when they have a tendon problem, just to rule it out. Great. Okay. Um, someone is asking, uh, and I think uh, this is a patient question. Um, how about chronic gluteal tendinopathy? That's taken a very long mm. time to diagnose. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really great question. Like diagnosis for gluteal tendinopathy um, is, is often missed. It's often kind of lumped in with low back pain. Um, and that's really interesting from the pain BC, you know, from the chronic pain community point of view, like a pretty substantial number of people who are placed into this mechanical low back pain category actually have a tendon injury. And um, the, the good news is that uh, they do respond. There, there is a rehab program for gluteal tendinopathy, which has been shown to be effective. Um, it's a really nice program that came out of University of Queensland. Um, the same group that did the elbow studies that I showed you, like very, very well conducted, high quality trial. Um, so if you'd like to email me, I can send you that resource and then you can use that. It, it follows the same principles of uh, uh, strengthening, strengthening the area, looking at the whole kinetic chain. And um, it's uh, gluteal tendinopathy is similar to the shoulder in a way, in that you've got a whole series of muscles which abduct and rotate the hip. And if one of them is injured or even ruptured, um, you can actually still regain really good function by using the other muscles in the area. Um, so, uh, you know, for example, if you rupture your Achilles tendon, you're going to have a lot of trouble walking because it's really just the one tendon doing that job. But at the shoulder and at the gluteal tendons, um, you can actually function quite well, even with a ruptured uh, tendon. So um, that's uh, hopefully reassuring for those people, but it, it does take a lot of time. Uh, but the rehab can be very effective. Alex, um, so the same patient is saying that she's had a lot of um, different therapies that didn't work. And I guess kind of along with what you're recommending with the, with the University of Queensland um, program, where would you go for that therapy? She's asking where should she go for exercise, exercise rehab? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I'm kind of a proud member of our physio association of BC. And um, so I, I, I don't want to necessarily recommend one member over another, but um, um, you know, I think if you come to, to a, a physiotherapist who is used to treating um, musculoskeletal problems, like especially if, they, if they're used to treating sports injuries, um, and if you can come to them with, with a copy of that uh, paper, uh, and say, look, I'm really interested in this rehab program that was used in this study um, for my gluteal tendinopathy. Um, do you think you'd be able to help me work through it? Um, I would think, uh, I, I think most physios would be able to, to do that. Um, if you're having trouble finding a physiotherapist, um, you, could, you could also try a kinesiologist uh, to, to do the exercise part of it with you. And I'll just put in a plug for the uh, practitioners list on the Pain BC website. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That lists um, practitioners who have done um, training uh, and have extra knowledge and skills in chronic pain. Right. Um, okay, the next question, and I think I'm not going to pronounce this correctly either. Um, so the NOI group referenced some research on lateral epicondylitis and central nervous system changes. Have you heard of this? 
Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I was hoping to talk about was some of the differences between the lower extremity and then the upper extremity tendinopathies. Um, so in the Achilles and the patella, um, the evidence, there isn't really usually a lot of evidence of central uh, sensitization. So that's the concept that the nervous system itself um, becomes dysregulated so that normal uh, sensations, normal movements uh, become painful. And um, also you can get widespread hypersensitivity at different parts of the body uh, that are in the same segment as the injured tissue, but also in, in, in other segments up and down the body as well. And that does seem to be a much more common uh, feature in the elbow and in the shoulder. Um, I have a PhD student right now who's, who's researching that area actively because um, right now it's not a standard part of our clinical assessment to look for nervous system sensitization. And it's actually really hard to categorize people as, as to, to find out if there's something going on in their nervous system or not. Um, but uh, one way that you could do it is if, if you're, is this a, if this is a therapist asking the question, um, there's some, some testing protocols out there to look at sensitization in the spinal cord. Um, so you can use, um, uh, it's called temporal summation of pain or wind up. And if you can just, just take uh, one of your sort of neurofilaments that you can test with, just a pin prick, and you, you, you prick repeatedly like at one second intervals, um, and then track people's pain levels. Um, you can do that over the painful area, and then over a non, non-affected area, and then you can find out if there's wind up uh, in, the, in the painful area. Uh, but just, yeah, maybe generally looking for segmental sensitization, sensitivity uh, to palpation in the spinal segments um, up in the neck. It's very common to find that with the elbow and the shoulder, and so there's often things that can be treated up in the neck as well. Um, to try and reduce some of that sensitivity. Um, then there's the whole aspect of, you know, the involvement of the brain in, in as part of the sensitization process. And, um, you know, unfortunately, we just don't have great assessments for that right now. Um, but if you do see somebody who's got more of a chronic pain um, type presentation where um, there's a, a, a lot of movement guarding, there can be um, a very widespread uh, sensitivity to palpation uh, in large areas of the body and things like that, then, you know, it might be worth thinking about if there's pain uh, clinics, pain services in your area that you could refer that person to and try and catch them as early as possible. Because if somebody starts heading down that central sensitization pathway, um, there actually are classes of drugs um, that, that can specifically deal with that. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's a really good question to, to Kind of keep your antenna open for people who have more of a prominent sensitization type presentation for sure. Okay, Alex, we've got five more questions. Are you up for answering all those? Sure, sure, yeah. Great. Okay, um, given the findings that patients with Achilles tendinopath tendinopathy have softer tendons causing less load acceptance, is there still rationale to stretch the tendon? Yeah, I mean, that's a really great question. So, so what you're doing with, um, you know, anytime you put load through the tendon, uh, and that includes functional things like walking, running, uh, but also like structured exercise, like uh, calf presses or uh, those types of exercise. You know, whenever the muscle is active, the tendon stretches. Um, and, and so it's just important to be in mind, like if you think about an isometric contraction, um, the muscle is, is contracting really hard and it's the tendon that's stretching. So overall, there's no change in the muscle tendon unit length, but the tendon is getting stretched a lot with an isometric contraction. And so absolutely there's a rationale for that. And it comes back to that mechanotherapy mechanism where um, by you know, stretching that cell, stimulating it in a controlled way, um, you can stimulate collagen synthesis. And the best way to do that, as we said, is not so much with your repetitive. So say you've got a runner who's come in, you've been exercising and their tendon's all irritated and it's lost some, some, some of its hardness. Um, if you want to build that back up again, you, you need heavy, slow resistance. And you know, even a, a good 10 second rest period in between each repetition of, of their uh, stretch. So yeah, it's just sort of this weird concept of exercise actually being a stretch on the tendon. But I think it's, it's passive stretching, you know, is not so important. It's more about uh, that active, 
component to the rehab. Okay, um, is it, can you comment on whether it's safe to admit, administer soft tissue release in acute tendinopathy? If yes, do you have any comments on the area um, to start treatment from? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, if, I think the person is referring to, could, I wonder if we could clarify with them what they mean by soft tissue uh, release, um, whether they're just talking about sort of a mas massage technique or if they're talking about um, something more, uh, you know, more and more heavy duty. <laughs> okay, um, okay, maybe we'll wait, Nafiz, if you want to comment on that. Um, okay. If you're still there, then we can go come back to that question. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, we'll just wait for that one. Okay. Um, can you comment on the treatment of adductor tendinopathy in goalkeepers? In uh, what was the last word? Goalkeepers. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a really challenging one. Adductor tendinopathies. Um, so how would you comment on that? I mean, yeah. <laughs> Why that one really blindsided me. Um, the doctor's tendinopathies are really challenging, like groin pain in, in athletes. Um, and you think about the kind of demands that a goalie is placing through that part of the body. Uh, it's, it's, it's really challenging. Um, and, you know, I, I think we're going to come back to the similar, same sort of treatment paradigm, um, the whole kinetic chain approach where, um, you know, building load tolerance through the tendon and through its attachments is going to be really important with some with some specific exercises to load that, but also the whole kinetic chain and the core. Um, you know, making sure that, that whole core is as strong as it can be. Um, you know, that person is going to need really good range of motion, and so I, I guess it's going to take a lot of. Um, it's, it's it's going to take some really intensive load management. You know, because because going into the game and re-irritating and re-injuring that um, is, uh, is is, is going to be the challenge. Um, you know, groin pain in athletes can be really recalcitrant; like like take a long time to recover. And so sometimes a, a period of, of backing off and, and just focusing on the rehab is really important. Um, I realize I'm just talking kind of in generalities, and and I I'm going to apologize for that. Um, just recognize in the question that. Uh, you know, the general treatment approach that I presented here, um, it does hold true for adductor tendinopathies as well. Um, and I just appreciate how challenging that is. Okay, final question. Um, okay. Why is PRP so widespread if it doesn't work? Hey, that's a really good question. Um, I, I, part of me wanted to get all philosophical there because I was thinking about all the all the different beliefs that people have, which turn out to be uh, not true, like the world being flat and, and all kinds of other things. <laughs> but it's, um, I think it actually comes from a good place. I think you know, um, chronic tendon pain is is no joke. Like um, for a lot of people, um, they they can be quite desperate and looking, looking for something. And they, they, the physician, you know, is coming from a good place. They really want to be able to provide something. Um, that's, that's, that's my, my rosy tinted answer. I mean, there's a darker side to it. Like this is a money maker for some, for some people, there's no doubt about it. Like they charge a lot of money for these injections. And um, so that's another thing. There is a commercial aspect to this. Um, um, and then I guess the final point would be that um, people have different ways of, of weighting the evidence and they can really highly weight testimonial, especially if it was from an athlete um, that, uh, you know, that, that, that was sort of speaking highly of the treatment and then they, they feel that they want to have access to it as well. Um, so, you know, to, as we showed, like on, on average, a lot of people do recover naturally from tendinopathies as their tissues heal and as, as they recover. So if they happen to have had a PRP injection and they're one of the people that was going to be getting better anyway, then, um, you know, oh, somebody's asking for references. Are you looking for references on PRP? Suzanne Thorson asked for references. That was, that was, uh, I don't have specific references for why PRP is so popular, but I can give you a paper that was written by the International Olympic Commission. Oh, okay. 
International Olympic Commission calling for more um, evidence on this. Um, and, and they go into some of the background about why they thought uh, this treatment was starting to uh, was starting to take off, even though it didn't have evidence behind it. And a lot of it came down to like high profile athletes um, getting testimonial about it. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Alex. Um, I think we have, I'm not seeing any other questions at this point, and we've gone quite a bit over. So just want to say thank you so much to everybody for um, staying with us and for uh, coming today um, on your lunch hour and, and uh, being with us for this webinar. Really appreciate it. And Alex, thanks so much to you. That was so interesting. And we just really appreciate your time and all of your knowledge and expertise. Well, it's a real privilege to talk to a group of frontline practitioners and, um, you know, I, I understand the challenges of being out there and trying to take what you can from this information and uh, that I, I just uh, really thank you for spending the time listening and I really hope that some of it uh, can, you can find useful with your patients. Wonderful. Okay. Well, happy holidays to everyone. and. Um, Again, please uh, fill out the evaluation, which uh, will come um, in your, uh, when we send out the recording, you'll get a link to the evaluation. And um, do check back to the PNBC website and we hope to see you um, next year. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.